We're continuing our study through Matthew's Gospel, and this morning we find ourselves in the 22nd chapter of Matthew's Gospel, and we'll be looking at verses 15 through 22. So that is Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. And if you have indeed found your way to our passage, I'd invite you to join with me in standing together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Matthew 22, beginning at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. They brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed. And leaving him, they went away. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. We're thankful, Father, for your sovereignty. And yes, our nation... And our world is in a time of unprecedented turmoil, at least in accordance to our lifetimes. We've never seen anything quite like this. Violence in the streets, disease in the air. Uh, We pause for a moment to reflect on the fact that uh, you are sovereign and that these things will be ultimately used in perfect accordance with your good purposes. We may not see, Father, how this will conclude or how this will bring about your good purposes, but we trust in you. Our confidence is unwavering. Our sureness is stayed. We know our God, and therefore we do not fear. Father, we uh, pray that this morning as your people, we would come to your word with the knowledge and the reality that God is speaking to us. We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts like a well-prepared field ready to receive the good seed that we might spring up, produce some 60, some 100-fold. We pray, Lord, that you would hide the one who preaches in the shadow of Christ. His sins are many. We pray that you would Use this time to challenge us and to change us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. God is good all the time. We're going to try that one more time. God is good all the time. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. We've been studying for some time this great event of Jesus finally reaching the city of Jerusalem. The entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem is without historic peer. Up until his entrance into Jerusalem, Jesus has by and large veiled his identity. And now with his entrance into Jerusalem, the cloak is removed and he is declaring himself to be the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah, both to Israel and to the world. The words and works of Jesus in this city of Jerusalem begin in Matthew chapter 21, will occupy the remainder of Matthew's gospel with the exception of the five last words of Matthew 28. As Jesus arrives at Jerusalem, we've noticed all along that his arrival begins with confrontations, confrontations between Jesus, the Son of God, and Jerusalem's religious leaders, all of chapter 21, 22, and 23. 
will contain the record of these confrontations. We've been pointing out that these confrontations that ensue between Jesus and the religious leaders consist of three sets of three. The first set of three are three messianic and authoritative actions, one after the other. And we've looked at these and studied through them, they being first his messianic entrance into Jerusalem, the second being the cleansing of the temple, and finally the withering of the fig tree. Three messianic authoritative actions, one after the other. Last week we completed the final of the next set of three, and those are three parables, again, one after the other. They are the parable of the two sons, the parable of the vineyard, and last week the parable of the king's feast. This morning we come to the first of the final set of three, and that is three hostile questions and answers between Jesus and the Son of God. This morning we're looking again at that first of a final set of three. Now as you think about this for a moment, let me remind you of the reality, the historic reality behind this, and that is to say that Jesus has been in the midst of sustained serious conflict. If you're like me, I don't like conflict. I do everything in the world I can to avoid conflict until the conflict cannot be avoided. I think most of us are like that unless you have some warped personality or something where you thrive on conflict and I think there's maybe people that are like that. Conflict gives meaning to their life. Not me. In fact, sometimes I wonder, I dislike conflict so much I don't know why I chose to be a pastor. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't choose to be a pastor but was chosen to be a pastor, right? But conflict, conflict between Christians, conflicts in marriage, conflicts over theology, conflicts. Yet Jesus finds himself in the midst of a prolonged and persistent conflict. And as a Bible teacher, one of the things that strikes me, really, is the question or the idea of how it is that God uses conflict. What I think we find in Scripture and what we find in history is that conflict is often the way in which God chooses to allow truth claims to be identified, truth claims to be articulated, truth claims to be clarified, truth claims which now in the midst of conflict uh, demand our otherwise indifferent attention, truth claims through conflict that happen to grab or grasp a, a larger audience at large than would be if apart from the, the conflict. For instance, if you know your New Testament, you know that virtually the entire New Testament is made up of truth claims. And many of these truth claims come to light because of the rise of conflict. Many of the books in the New Testament were written because of conflict. Theological conflicts, ethical conflicts, uh, practical conflicts, personal conflicts. Conflicts are that means by which God really grabs a hold of something that's important and, and allows that conflict to become the platform by which these things are indeed identified and articulated, clarified, and brought to the attention of many. Conflict is often the way in which the truth takes center stage. Often these conflicts engage with the powers that be. That's happening in our own country right now. That was true for the Old Testament prophets engaged in conflicts over truth with the powers that be. It was true for Jesus, it's in our text. It's true for the apostles who were dragged before kings and so forth and so on. As Presbyterians, we know that was certainly true for the reformers. And it's true for the church today, right now. Conflicts, God-given conflicts, which provide a platform upon which truth, truth claims, can be identified and articulated and held forth, declared, grasping a larger audience than would normally be the case apart from conflict. And by the way, as we look at this 
final stage of redemption, Jesus arriving in Jerusalem, these conflicts between Jesus and these religious leaders are conflicts that are unfolding before a watching crowd, a watching world. Conflicts about the truth before onlookers. Jesus, who is the living refutation to all forms of false religion, becomes the key to these conflicts. And what we have in these chapters 21, 22, and 23 is a public conflict about the things of God. This conflict is the platform that really becomes the opportunity for Jesus giving us a deep, revealing, exposing, articulated revelation on what the truth is concerning God and concerning God's kingdom. Another way to say that would be that these Pharisees and Herodians and Sadducees and so forth are really sovereignly used by God to provide Christ the opportunity in his final days on earth, in humanity and in flesh, to clarify what is the absolute truth of the matter. One thing I think also needs to be pointed out as we look at this is that it's Jerusalem's leaders who from the outset really are the ones who attack and trap and test and initiate this kind of conflict. Right in our text, you look at verse 15, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. It's not Jesus, it's the leaders who are the the sort of sinful catalysts and aggressors who conspire to give weight and heat to these conflicts. At no point do we see Jesus as, as sort of the instigator, the agitator, although he will not compromise. I will say this, though, from the outset, we never see Jesus as that. By the time we're done with this last set of Q&As, we will see Jesus come unhinged as he um, exposes and, and pronounces judgment upon the hypocrisy of these leaders. Having said all that, let's jump into the text itself. First, I want you to notice the conspiracy on words. Let me say that again, the conspiracy on words. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Verse 15 through 17. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth. Defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us, then, what do you think? When I titled this section, or this first point, The Conspiracy on Words, I'm referring to the obvious a misdirection of men in relationships, relationship to the words of Jesus. These leaders, listen to this, are not in the least bit interested in what Jesus is actually saying, which is dumbfounding. They're not the least bit interested in this profound end time, final messages of God in the person of Christ, they don't care about the content. They're only interested in finding words that can be used against him. Finding words that can both affirm and advance their own agenda. And here's the point. For them, the truth, the true truth, has become nothing more than a word game. And that's dangerous. And that exists today. When you're trying to, any of us, trying to articulate and define, defend the great truths of Scripture, and it becomes nothing more than a word game. Trying to explain how the Scripture describes the depravity of man and our desperate need and our bondage to sin, and it becomes a word game. Or we try to declare the sovereignty of God and all of his love and his grace, and it becomes a word game. A gotcha. It's dangerous and it exists today. By and large, we believe that what the scripture says is is clear. It's clear. Scripture says what it says and it doesn't say it in some way that's guarded or camouflaged or it's clear. And yet it becomes for many a word game. You'll notice in verse 16, where the hypocrisy begins to unfold, they address Jesus as teacher. Why teacher? Because that's, that's what he did. That's what he was. It's the most common 
a title for Jesus in the, in the New Testament Gospels. The disciples referred to Jesus as teacher. The crowds in the north referred to him as teacher. The crowds in the south referred to him. He's the teacher. Trick question, what do teachers do? They teach. And how did Jesus teach? With words. Many, many words. He taught with many words to many people in many ways. Teacher. Virtually, a little exaggeration, virtually 24-7, Jesus was teaching. Teaching, teaching, more teaching, more teaching. Tells us a little bit about the priority and importance of teaching. And frankly, as a Bible teacher, I really don't know how he did it. I've told my wife in my session on more than one occasion, I am so tired of hearing myself. (laughs) Jesus taught relentlessly. But on top of all that, so that we might understand our Savior a little more, not only did he teach and teach and teach, why? Because he knows that teaching, the Word of God, is transformative. We are renewed, our minds are renewed by what? The Word of God. And Christ knew it. But on top of all that, not only did he teach and pour himself out in his teaching consistently and ongoingly, but on top of all that, and this scene is not unique to Jesus, as he's doing that, some people listen to Jesus, and they listen to Jesus in a way that is not instructional. But rather, they're listening to Jesus for one reason, to be critical of what he says. Just to catch him. Just to be able to cite him in some derogatory way. To be able to snag him on his words, trap him on his words, and snare him because of his words. They listen to Jesus for one reason, to catch him saying something that could be used against him. Now, can you imagine if what you do for a living is teach and teach and teach and teach, and there are some who are listening to you, and the only reason they're doing that is to catch you? That would be awful. Be awful. And yet, here's the point. You know what? Despite all of that, Jesus never stopped, what, teaching. The hypocrisy in this text is thick. You'll notice verse 16, they come to him. Teacher, we know that you are what? Truthful, and you teach the way of God, and you do so in truth, and you defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Verse 17, tell us then, what do you think? You want to know something? Everything they said about him was the truth but they didn't mean it. Their phony flattery, though speaking the truth, is also an example of the absolute opposite of how Jesus taught. When I think of Christ as a teacher, Jesus focused only on the truth, and not the truth in general, but specifically the truth of God, about man, about sin, about salvation, about the world, about the world to come. And Jesus, listen to this, he never vacillated. He never vacillated depending on the circumstance. He never vacillated when the audience changed, regardless of who the audience was. He never vacillated according to what he perceived as other expectations of his teaching. He never vacillated in the face of danger. He never vacillated to accumulate honor. He spoke the world word uncompromisingly and he did so with all authority he did so unequaled he was all-knowing all understanding without peer and with perfect communication skills he taught the word of God he taught the word of God like no one has ever taught the word of God nor will teach the word of God ever and people listened to him and all they did was engage in word games Truly, these men, maybe women, listened to Jesus without ears to what? To hear. Now, this is a scene that's, that's just amazing, fraught with uh, an exposure to the danger of hypocrisy and, and so forth. Look at verse 16 and 17. Let's not miss this. It says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians. Um, you might look at this and go, okay, what? Let me just, just for a minute, pause. This is quite a scene. First of all, it says that the Pharisees send their disciples. 
You know what that is? These are Pharisees in training. These are, these are elementary level Pharisees who are trying to make their ranks up in the Pharisaical world. The Pharisees' disciples. Jesus had disciples. The Pharisees had disciples. As Jesus would have taught his disciples how to be like Jesus, here we see the Pharisees teaching their disciples how to be like Pharisees. And you do get this, don't you? It's shocking. Yeah, something like this to be a little bit sarcastic, something like this. Today's Pharisee uh, training lesson 101 is this. We want you to go and find this Jesus. We want you to use some phony flattery. We want you to ask him some entrapping questions, which will be provided for you in today's syllabus. Don't actually listen to a word he says, but listen very carefully for something that we can use against him. Can you imagine that? We're sending you, ostensibly, because you're probably not as recognizable as we might be to Jesus. And also, really, right, better you than us that Jesus should expose your hypocrisy. We've been there. It's your turn. Everybody get this. And also, as we've seen and experienced, we're not quite sure how this is all going to turn out. So we're sending you our disciples, to do our duty work, to engage in political maneuverings, the political maneuverings of religion, false religion. And here we are seeing Pharisees training others to be just like themselves. And Jesus, Jesus you will see, will point this out. You will travel land and sea to make disciples after your own selves. Remember that? You hypocrites. But not only do we see the Pharisees' disciples being sent, but we also see the Herodians kind of joining the bandwagon. Verse 16, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. This is more unbelievable than meets the eye. Who are the Herodians? The Herodians were on the absolute opposite end of the spectrum from the Pharisees. The, the, this would be alt-right and alt-left. I'm serious. Who were the Herodians? They were those who were committed passionately to the Herodian dynasty. Herodian dynasty... Herod the Great wasn't even a Jew. He was an Indomian. He was placed in power by the Romans. He was behind the scenes working with the Romans on the, on the face, hypocritically engaged with Israel and Judaism. But he was, he was Rome's puppet used by Rome to take advantage of the Jews. And these people liked that because they believed Rome offered them as Jews advantages that could never come from just sheer Judaism nor from God. So on one hand, you have the Pharisees who were religious, the Herodians who were political, the Pharisees who were jealous for the law, the Herodians who were jealous for the politics of the Herodian dynasty. You had the Pharisees who hated the Roman occupation of Israel, the Herodians who loved it, the Pharisees who saw Jesus as a threat to the religious power, and the Herodians who saw Jesus as a possible insurrectionist against Rome. Vastly different. Yet... What we see in this scene is a desperate coalition willing to set all aside their differences but unite in conspiring together because of their fear of Jesus, albeit for very different reasons, united by fear of Jesus and coming to Jesus again without ears to hear. Second point, the conspiracy on words. I notice, I draw your attention, verse 17. I'll call this the issue of a poll tax. Tell us then, they ask, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? If you bear with me, let me give you a little history so you actually understand what's taking place in this question. Uh, you may remember the name Pompey. Pompey was the famous Roman general and statesman. And what Pompey is most famous for in history was transforming Rome from a republic to an empire. And so what Pompey did is he changed the, the purview of the empire, or excuse me, the, 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 uh, the republic to an empire by adding the idea of Roman expansionism. That is, take over the world, take over other nations. And Pompey, during the last years of the Roman Republic, uh, brought Israel under Rome's control, 63 BC, arguably 60 years before birth of Christ. 
And from that point on, Israel ceased to be an independent kingdom. At that point, early on, Israel was ruled by client kings, kings who worked for Rome behind the scenes but gave the face of being for the people. And, of course, that would include Herod the Great. In A.D. 6, things changed and Rome moved from using vessel kings like Herod the Great and began to rule over the occupied countries, including Israel, directly. And in 86, they did away with these fake kings and they began to install Romans, Roman governors and Roman procurators. Uh, one name, be familiar, uh, Pontius Pilate. And as a part of this 6 AD new reform to Roman rule, the Romans imposed an annual poll tax. A poll tax demanded one denarius. A denarius was equal to one day's wage. The denarius required by Rome had to be a specific coin, and it was levied against every adult, adult, male and female, from puberty uh, to age 65. Roman citizens were exempt from the poll tax. The poll tax was levied on those whom Rome had conquered and occupied. The Romans called this poll tax the tributum, or the tribute. And the idea is they forced the paying of this poll tax on people as a way to make these people offer tribute to Rome and to Caesar. The idea of a poll is the idea of counting heads. We're in political season. We're going to hear a lot about polls. What are polls? Polls are counting of heads. We're going to vote. We're going to go to a poll. What happens at a voting poll? The counting of heads. So this poll tax was Rome's way of counting the heads of those people whom they had subjected, uh, who, who they had conquered, uh, over whom they had domination, who, over whom they had subjected and humiliated, by making them each pay tribute to Caesar and to Rome. That was a poll tax. And obviously, you can imagine, the poll tax was deeply deeply resented. One more point of history, which is, is, isn't in the text, but let me just say, prior to Jesus' birth, as these poll taxes began to be levied against Israel, there was a resistance against Rome that rose among the Jews, and it was led by a man named Judas, specifically Judas of Galilee. He's actually mentioned in Acts 5.37. And some scholars, fine scholars, point out the fact that when, when these Pharisees and so forth realize that Jesus is from the Galilee and, and he's coming, is he another Galilean who has strong views, strong opinions about paying this poll tax uh, to Rome? Here's another Galilean insurrectionist possibly. So thirdly, conspiracy on words, the issue of poll tax. Thirdly, the question of image. And this is really where... The rubber meets the road. Verse 18, but Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Um, many years ago, um, I remember being on a flight line in the pitch dark, freezing cold, San Antonio, Texas, going through a boot camp or basic training in the United States Air Force. <laughs> and one of the rules, lots of rules, lots and lots of rules. You got a rule for everything. One of the rules was you could never wear a watch uh, to physical training. And I remember on the flight line standing there, and this drill instructor comes to me and sticks a Bremis hat on my forehead and says, Son, what time is it? And knee jerked, I've lifted up. And as I'm doing this, I'm realizing, oh, oh, I had a watch on. And we won't go into what happened next. Um, Jesus didn't ask what time it was. You know what he asked for? A coin. And guess what? They had one. They had one. A little bit about this coin, and you'll get it. The coin is a specific coin. It's almost pure silver. It's one of the most expensive in that day, 
very distinct from the common coins, mostly copper in Israel. The coin is a Roman denarius. It's what Rome required the poll tax to be paid in. So every male, female, from puberty to 65, once a year, paid one day's wage in the form of this particular coin to Rome as a tribute to Rome, to Caesar. That's what it was. Having said that, this coin is definitely something that Jesus has never had, nor did he have. He had to do what? He had to ask for one. Everybody got that? Say amen. We've seen this poll tax coin appear already in Matthew's gospel. You remember they asked, does your master pay taxes? And Jesus goes into this whole thing, essentially saying, listen, this world is mine. Why am I paying you taxes? Everybody got that? But he says to Peter, so that we don't offend them, go to sea, throw a line to sea, you'll catch a fish, open his mouth, and you'll find one of these coins. Again, what we, see, what we see there is Jesus didn't carry these coins on him, ever. Uh, this coin that Jesus asked for, which he doesn't have and they happen to have, is more than an object lesson. It is really, uh, uh, it is really the, the grounds for an extraordinarily important theological lesson. The front of this coin that I'm talking about bore the image on one side, the front side, of Tib- Tiberius Caesar's face. Uh, the side of his face. He's crowned, his head is crowned with a royal garland, pronouncing him king and all of that, God. And around the inscription of Tiberius Caesar are the abbreviated words for Tiberius Caesar Divi Augusti Philusius Augustus. You know what it means? Listen to this. Translated means Tiberius Caesar Augustus, the son of the divine Augustus. That's his father. On the back side of the coin... Or the image of Tiberius Caesar's mother, Livia, who is seated also on a throne. One hand is raised holding a scepter. The other hand is holding a bouquet. And around the image are the words Pontiff Maximum. Do you know what that means? Our great high priest. So in all, this little silver coin asked once a year by Rome from the people claimed that Tiberius Caesar was first the son of God And secondly, our great high priest. Uh, For obvious reasons, Jesus didn't carry this coinage. Yet, it was given to him, he had to ask one by the Pharisees who were complaining about it, yet possess it because it's very valuable and important glimpse at the hypocrisy that's taking place in this thing. What is the point of all this? Now, some people have taken the idea of render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God, the things of God, as a statement about Jesus on the separation of church and state. You know, some things belong to the state, some things belong to God. We need to make those careful distinctions. Um, well, it's true, as Christians, we're called to, to, be, um, to be faithful citizens without reproach against God. That's not the point he's making. Some people have said, no, it's all about finances. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, but make, God, make sure God gets his due as well, right? If you're going to give so much to Caesar, you need to make sure that you at least do that for God. It's not about that either. What is he saying? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. It's about image bearing. That's what it's about. You know, I believe that one of the greatest, I really believe this, I believe that one of the greatest needs in our world today is for human beings to figure out what it means to be a human being. Now, as Christians, we're real clear and quick to say, yeah, and they need to know about God. Yes, they do. And they need to know about Jesus, but yes, they do. But beings, human beings, don't know what it means to be a human being. Several years ago in a northern newspaper, an article was written titled, The Irony of Being Human. In this article, two stories were accounted for. It made up the article as a whole. The first story involved a young woman in her late 20s who the day before had left her husband, left her children, left her home, ran away to be with another man. They, they met up together for this new venture life at a particular downtown hotel. The next, man, the next morning, the man had told her that he's, he thought about it through the, through the night and that, he's, that he determined that the best thing he could do was return to his wife. And he left her sitting in that hotel, contemplating all that she had lost. 
She had lost her family. She had lost her husband. She had lost her job. She had lost her reputation. She had lost it all. In an unbelievable despair, she reached into her purse and pulled out a gun, and she took her life right there in that hotel room. The police told that reporter that there was a note on the nightstand with just a few words scribbled on it. It said, don't cry for me. I'm not even human anymore, end quote. The irony comes in the second story, because in that same hotel, at that very same hour that she took her life, there was meeting downstairs in a convention center, a group of people. Back then, we called them New Agers. I'm not quite sure what we call them today. But the meeting ended with a celebrity New Ager giving her speech, and at the end of her speech, she had everyone stand to their feet and lift their hands in the air, and together start shouting in unison, I am God, I am God. I am God. The irony of being human. Am I worthless? Do I view humanity as worthless? Brothers and sisters, all we have to do is turn on the television and read the headlines, and we will see many people treating each other as if they're worthless. Because they have no idea what it means to be a human being. And then you have people like Tiberius Caesar reigning and ruling over people as if they're God, living their life centered on themselves, serving themselves, worshiping themselves. The irony of being human. What does it mean to be a human being? If our world can figure that out, it'll change our world. Psalm 8 says, what is man that you take thought of him? begins by David saying, when I, when I consider the, the works of your hands, the earth, the, the universe, the stars, you can imagine, if you can be in your mind's eye, transport yourself back 2,000 years ago to the Bedouin environment of ancient Israel, David, a shepherd boy, laying in the pitch dark of the night on his back, staring into the expanse in the desert. Now, if you've never seen the sky in a desert at nighttime, it's, it's unusual. Billions of stars, more than the mind can take in. And David asked himself the question, what is man that you take thought of him? How in the world can it be, God, that you are concerned with me? Think about me. Or the son of man that you care about him. And verse 5 says this, you have made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and majesty. We are the crowning moment of the creation. A little lower in God, a little higher than the angels. Man is endowed with dignity and favor and responsibility. The biblical account, Genesis 1:26, tells that man was created in God's image. Man was neither divine nor was he animal. He was God's image uniquely. Man is not the product of primordial processes or forces. You know, I've said this, the zoo, the, the goo did not become a zoo and the zoo eventually become you. We are created in the image and likeness of God, uniquely by God. The Bible tells us Adam's body was uniquely created by God from the dust of the earth and his soul was created by God when God breathed into him the breath of life, Genesis 2-7. To be human, whether you're male or female, is to uniquely bear God's image both in body and in soul. <laughs> Theologians refer to the fact that God has given to us as human beings what are often called the communicable attributes of God. That is, that we share in attributes that God possesses. Albeit at a creaturely level and a creaturely form and measure, we still share in things that Nothing else in the world does. It's so unique to be who we are. Human beings created in the image and likeness of God. Body and soul. Just think about this. You and I are self-conscious. We're self-conscious. Um, you and I are aware of the brevity of life. We understand one day we're going to die. My, your dog doesn't know it's going to die. Your trees don't know they're going to die one day. You do. Why would that be important to motivate us? Just think about the ability to love and to be loved, to communicate, to think, to reason. I could go on. We're so, so very unique. We're not nothing. We're something created just a little lower than God, yet higher than the angels. It's very unique to be you and me.
Jesus said to them, show me a coin. And they brought to him a denarius. Who's, who's, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. He said, fine. Render this coin, Caesar's image, give it to Caesar. But you, render to God the things that are God. What are the things that belong? The things that belong to God are the things that bear God's what? Image. His image. I think about the theology of the image that runs all through the scripture from beginning to end. God created man in the image and likeness of, of God. Then sin entered in the image and likeness of God was marred. And man didn't go away, but a certain was marred by sin. And then in Genesis 5, we read the tragic words. It says that when Adam and Eve gave birth, they bore a, a son that was in their image. And there is, there is the doctrine of depravity, original sin. You and I are born in the image of Adam, the fallen Adam. And so are your kids and their kids. So shall it ever be. And then you come to the, the, the Exodus and God bringing Israel out of bondage and setting them at Mount Sinai. And there is God on top. And he says to them, what? The Ten Commandments. Thou shall have no, uh, no what? Grave and what? Images. You know, the only image of God there is in the world is you and me. You and me. When reformers pulled out of the Roman church, one of the things they said is no icons, no images, no, no, no. And sometimes people sit here and they look at the plainness of the sanctuary and say, you know what, but you want to see the image of God? Get out a mirror. Get out a mirror. You and I are the unique created image and likeness of God. We move on even into the prophets. Remember even in Daniel chapter 3, there's Nebuchadnezzar erecting on the plains of Durham this large image. Remember the image. We go on, image, image, image. Then you come to the gospel. Jesus Christ comes, who is declared to be the perfect image and likeness of God, able to restore the marred, fallen image of, of man back to its original state, to reverse the curse in us, to restore the image in us, and even go to the very end of the Bible. If image appears in Genesis, it appears in Revelation. And what do we see that ultimately in apocalyptic language, what is it that we're fighting all along through all of human history? The image of the beast, which is not the image of God. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and render to God the things that are God. And what are the things of God? It's you, me, body, soul, and spirit, isn't it? All that we are, every gift, every talent, to live for God's glory. And you know what? To live as the image of God is something that is the most rewarding part of life in this world. To live the life that you were created to live. Everybody got that? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We need to be reminded. I think even how this little question and answer period ended, it ended with those people who came falsely to Jesus. They left, and it says they were amazed. Father, if they were amazed, help us to be even more so. But not in a phony sense, but in the spirit of truth and light. Your word is amazing. You are amazing. What you've done is amazing. What you're doing is amazing. And what you will do will also be amazing. This morning I pray, Father, for the person who may be hearing this either in this room or by, by, from a distance. We pray, Lord, that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that you would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is so clear. Repent of your sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the promise of God. Believe upon Christ. Father, for us who are Christians, in the midst of all these trials and troubles and so forth, help us to remember whose we are and who we are. Uh, we're not nothing. We're also not God. Uh, and that brings us great joy. We are the people of God bought by the blood of the Lamb. We are so dear to you. Father, your word tells us that your precious thoughts are us, of us each are more numerable than the sands of the sea. We can't even conceive that. What is man? 
that thou cares for him, but you do, in a way that is unimaginable. We worry, we fret, we fear, and yet we have a God that's watching over us in a way that we cannot contemplate. We love you and help us, Lord, to walk from this room amazed and to remember who we are, whose we are, and to live as images and likenesses of, the, of, of our God, to live the life that we were originally created to live, to live a life for the reason for which we are or to be reflections of our God in the world. And we love you and we praise you and all God's people said, Amen.